Edmund Burke is an interesting figure for us to encounter at the end of this survey, uh, this lecture being the final lecture in our initial survey of English literature. We've covered an enormous amount of time, uh, about 1,100 years or roughly speaking, from the time of Bede and Cademan to now um, Edmund Burke uh, and the American situation, or the colonists as he so frequently calls them. And I want to end with this piece for several reasons that I think will become clear after we just have a few moments to review some of the major points that are being made in his speech uh, on the conciliation with the American colonies. Because there's some really interesting things going on in here that are quite different than, um, well, a number of the ideas we've encountered so far this semester. And I think that this speech represents a real uh, kind of dividing point in the course, or maybe not so much a dividing point as a place where you could as you pursue your own educations, consider going down a number of roads, whether it is through an investigation of um, you know, literature in America by English-speaking peoples, or if you're to continue with the survey of English literature in both uh, England and continental Europe during the you know, 18th century, 19th century, and so on. So it's a nice dividing point, but I just want to just step back and before we get into any of that, just think a little bit about what Burke is saying here and, and how and how it might be just in and of itself an interesting thing to read, because this is obviously not poetry, this is not uh, prose, at least high style prose, uh, in the sense that it is not uh, a long narrative, and as we have read many narratives this semester, we might kind of wonder, well, what is this? It's obviously a political speech um, delivered to uh, a house of uh, governmental officials, excuse me, a body of governmental officials, and it's on an idea that is significant um, to uh, the people of England at the time. But anyway, we have the speech about who the people are in the colonies, and this is delivered at a moment uh, in time very close to the beginning of what um, you know, we now know as the American Revolution. Um, and he says a number of fascinating things about who the colonists are and, and how they should be considered that I just want to step back and, and focus on just for a couple of minutes. So he, he makes some very interesting kind of generalizations about the people in the the American colonies. And one of the first things he says, and this is connected to several of his other major points, is just this idea that the people who are now living in the colonies are descendants of Englishmen or people from England, uh, which is an interesting point. It's not entirely true, but certainly for the audience that he's speaking to, he's trying to make this essential point that they are our descendants, okay, so they're descendants from England, from the English people, and that they carry with them their essential English values and their essential English principles. And this is a fascinating statement. I think if we think about how language has developed in this course over a very long period of time, we've seen English become, um, you know, the common vocabulary or the common tongue for increasingly broader and broader segments of society. And by the time we get to Edmund Burke writing in the kind of mid 18th century, we have English as a formal form of discourse in government affairs, which is very different from where it was when we started this semester. And we, we can understand not just the difference, but we've seen how the language has developed over time as it has become more and more frequently used for different forms of discourse ranging from, you know, religious instruction or, you know, the, uh, the, the, the dissemination of, of religious ideas into, um, you know, new semi-conquered territories or semi-conquered people. We've seen it mixed with French and to slowly become a language for entertainment and storytelling. And we've seen it rise to discuss ideas as grand as, um, theological matters, certainly in Milton. Prior to that, we've seen it be able to, we've seen it been, how it's been harnessed to express some of the fundamental human concerns uh, that still ring true today with William Shakespeare. But now we're all the way up here with Edmund Burke, and we essentially have a politician talking about the American situation on the eve of the American Revolution, which he, of course, doesn't know about yet, because it hasn't happened yet. But there's this sense that the people in, Eng the, people in the American colonies are... English. So there's this fundamental connection that binds us in terms of our principles and in terms of our ideals across the Atlantic Ocean. And I know the Atlantic Ocean isn't an idea he brings up until the end 
of his piece. But one of the things I want you to have is some sense of here is how, how different this is from where we were earlier in the semester, where very small geographic differences had massive implications for culture. So when we were thinking about the Anglo-Saxon uh, invasions, the Norman invasions, and the difference between England and France, and uh, some of the other nations that came into play during that time, you know, Chaucer's journeys across Europe in a relatively small area bring him into contact with a really wider range, uh, a wide array of people and cultures and activities, and that's true of several authors that we've read this semester. Burke is saying that even though they're separated by something as, as literally mammoth as the Atlantic Ocean, these are still, we're essentially the same people. And, and what is it that binds them? What binds them, he says, is their kind of English uh, ideas and their English principles. But we could say even more fundamentally than that, what binds them is their language, is this common tongue. So I can be on one side of the Atlantic or the other side of the Atlantic, and I can understand those values. Well, where do those values come from? They come from the literature, not entirely, but they come from the literature we've been reading this semester, from Pilgrim's Progress, from Paradise Lost, from The Fairy Queen, from Shakespeare, from you know, from Dunn, from, from, from Johnson, from, any no, from, uh, from Pope, any number of people we've read this semester, and associated writers. It doesn't matter if you live on one side of the Atlantic or the other, these people are bound now, quite literally, by a common set of ideas and a common set of principles. And it's very important for us to recognize that we have witnessed the source of those principles, or we have witnessed a source of those principles in terms of how they are disseminated through a common tongue to a common people. We've watched its development over the past 15 weeks, which is, I think, a rather exciting thing to say that you can look back at this body of literature and say, yes, yes, I've seen how some of these ideas, some of these principles have been both expressed and also disseminated and also made into forms that people can understand uh, across a vast period of time. And that, I think, is a perspective that I'm obviously being self-serving here, but I think no matter what body of literature you're studying, whenever you see something like that, um, it, it can kind of really... Um, create a sharp contrast between what you learn when you're studying the humanities and what you might learn outside of the humanities. So I'm obviously making a big plug here for um, the study of literature, and I hope that you have enjoyed that. It's, it's not easy, but the rewards are enormous. So anyway, one of the first thing that, things that Burke points out is that even though they're on the other side of the Atlantic, they are us, essentially. They're English people. They're the descendants of Englishmen and they have our values and our ideas. So we shouldn't think about them as something else, and that's significant. Um, but he also says there are other things that are really important, that they represent us, they, and by us I mean the English, but they also left at a time when dissent was very high. And this is, of course, a, a gross generalization, but I think we can follow his logic here, where he's talking about the people who chose to leave, as, a peop as opposed to the people who were forced to leave, but the people who chose to leave left at a time or left under the conditions of dissent. So they were unhappy with the political structure that was currently operative in England, and so they chose to make this terrifyingly distant journey to live elsewhere. So they're dissenters. They're naturally dissenters. Now that, of course, is... Um, um, a statement that really lets kind of the English off easily, right? It's, it's like, well, these people who left, they just were unhappy with things, so they left. They're, they're just naturally dissenters. And that's, of course, well, perhaps not. Perhaps they're simply unhappy with a situation and they're quite happy elsewhere. Uh, but anyway, he's trying to characterize them so that there's some understanding of who they are. So they're English, they share our ideas, they share our principles, and they're dissenters because they left during a point in time when dissent was very high. And he kind of backs that statement up by pointing to their religious um, the religious uh, um, assumptions, or at least the assumptions he makes about their kind of religious dispositions, and he talks about them as being Protestants and how Protestants are kind of naturally people who dissent. Okay, and this is of course from uh, his own particular point of view, and I think the point of view of the Church of England, uh, which would view many Protestant communities as simply dissent communities because they are the power structure, the power source for many people um, in the region. He gets into that with these great comments about you know how. Uh, in the north and the south, you can see the significance of, the, of, of Protestantism to the way in which people interact with each other and uh, to, this, to the degree to which they are 
uh, willing to dissent or to be unhappy and how these things kind of bind them together. So he's kind of presenting the American people that's probably the wrong phrase. He's he, he's he's presenting kind of the the English descendants in the American colonies as people who are kind of like these bugs in amber, kind of trapped in time. They, they they have English values, they have English principles, but they represent this era of descent that has come and largely gone. And that's very Edmund Burke. Um, but we'll talk maybe more about that at a later point. So that's how he kind of characterizes us. And then he makes these really interesting comments about what it is that binds people to this fundamental notion of liberty. And, and this, I think, I think he says something quite insightful here that um, we don't perhaps often think enough about in American culture, but he makes this you know, this divide between the northern and the southern colonies, uh, you know, a full century before the Civil War occurs. And he notes how you have these issues of kind of education and this kind of natural inclination for dissent in the Protestant religions in the North, okay, which if you look out your window is kind of where you live. And he's saying that, that that is what binds them to this notion of liberty and their desire for liberty and their desire to have their own money and their desire to study law and all of these things, just this natural compulsion to, to, to dissent. But then he talks about the South. And one of the things he talks about is how in the Southern colonies there are more slaves. And he makes this really interesting observation about societies that have slaves. And one of the things that he points out is that when you have a society that has slaves, the people who are not slaves tend to value their freedom more because it's something that defines them against the slaves, or perhaps it's something that gives them some sense of protection against the slaves. So whereas in the North, you have this kind of religious inclination towards dissent that is really driving the Northerners for this strong, uh, this strong, uh, intense uh, passion for liberty. In, in the South, the source of the love for liberty is the proximity um, that these people live, um, in which they live with slaves. So this sense that they see, you know, what can happen very uh, obviously to someone who doesn't have liberty um, in the same environment. And I think this has all kinds of fascinating implications for a study and examination of contemporary American culture. Um, you know, do people have liberty because they, they, they want to dissent and they have a, a point of view where the notion of dissent leading to liberty is kind of fundamental? Or do we have people who are kind of clinging to a notion of liberty because they have some awareness that they live with many people who do not have it? kind of a, a contemporary slave class, which might certainly exceed kind of racial boundaries. It's a fascinating idea. And I think as you get, if you choose to kind of pursue American literature um, and the study of American literature, you'll see all kinds of really interesting comments on that and takes on that. But I won't say too much about that here because we're just studying English literature um, um, in, in, a, in the context of England. So I'll, I'll focus on that. But Burke seems to be aware of this difference. Uh, and he gives reference uh, to it existing all the way back to ancient Rome. So if you live with slaves, it tends to have an implication on how you view the world, according to Edmund Burke. And so he points that out. And he, again, kind of concludes near the end, uh, much, as, much as if you've ever read Thomas Paine, like Common Sense, um, in which he points out, you know, in a very straightforward way, the significance of the Atlantic Ocean uh, to the American situation cannot be understated. So you have people who are so remote and there is no technology that can reach them quickly. And the orders that come from England literally have to travel 3,000 miles before they can get there. And then they have to travel 3,000 miles back before anybody knows what the outcome is. Uh, it's just this incredible uh, kind of warping reality that makes communication between these people challenging. Uh, but notice one of the things he doesn't say, uh, even though there is this enormous, enormous ocean and even though there is this enormous divide, language seems to be more than capable of kind of resisting uh, that geographic difference. So even though you have these people in very different you know, locations on the globe, the English language nevertheless serves to bind them, even over this extended period of time, well over a century by this point, where people from England or people associated with England have been settling in the colonies. So Burke is trying to make other people aware of this reality. And it's, 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 a, it's a kind of beautiful gesture, I think, on the eve of a very destructive war. But it's also coming at a point in time where there's a lot of political 
um, uncertainty uh, for England, which we're not going to talk about right now. Maybe in another class we could get into that. But he's trying to make this basic, you know, this basic association between the English uh, living in England and uh, the English descendants uh, living in the American colonies, which is which is nice to see, right? Uh, and, and he's trying to draw attention to or explain why it is they're reluctant to be taxed and why it is they want to create their own money and how all of this can somehow be kind of um, nailed down to this fundamental desire for liberty. It's all very nice. Let's step back from it now and say it's a beautiful way to imagine the situation, but it's also grossly reductive, right? Uh, and what it completely seems to overlook is the fact that you can't uh, describe people broadly and accurately at the same time. So to say the English living in the American colonies are kind of walking around with this drive for liberty is perhaps a fantasy, but is it in any way true? Well, you know, would you imagine any large group of people would be able to kind of sustain some common you know, strong desire for liberty, a fairly abstract notion in their day-to-day -day lives. It's, it's quite romantic, and we are indeed kind of entering into the age of romanticism, which becomes a big part of the next part of this survey, but this idea that I might take a broad notion and use it to generally characterize a people or a place or an experience um, is a fascinating, uh, uh, fascinating thought that perhaps comes more from the romance than from anywhere else. But anyway, Edmund Burke is really trying to help people, um, a certain set of people, the political class of England, understand um, the people of, of uh, the American colonies because they're on the eve of war with these people and the war will have great consequences for what comes next. So let's just kind of back up here and, and think about why this document is so important, even if what it says is rather fanciful and quite frankly dismissive of the American people, as much as it's trying to paint them in a positive light. Um, whenever you start describing an, an entire population as being, you know, held to one ideal or another, you know, you're being, you're being dismissive. What do I mean by that? Well, if you were to walk into any moderate body of people and look around and say all these people feel one way all the time, you know, you would quickly realize that your observation is probably pretty shallow. But it's fascinating at this moment because we haven't seen this before. Uh, we haven't seen this way of dealing with people, primarily because we haven't read much political dialogue in this course, but many of the documents we've read this semester have been this really interesting and intense observations of individuals, right? So going back as far as Chaucer, you know, Chaucer doesn't speak broadly about people. He gives us these really fascinating characters. Even Spencer, writing through allegory, the Red Cross Knight is interesting as a person. Una is interesting as a person. Even the dwarf is interesting as a person, though the dwarf doesn't get very many lines in the section that we read. Um, and we've seen this with Shakespeare's sonnets, and we've seen this even with Satan, who's very interesting in Paradise Lost, okay? Um, even the uh, very quick poems we get, for example, to his coy mistress. Nobody really has a name there, but we have this fascinating character talking to another fascinating character, we assume, uh, in an order to kind of seduce and persuade the object of uh, the speaker's affections. Um, but we haven't had yet somebody who has spoken, I don't want to say we haven't had, because I I don't remember everything perfectly, but as far as I can recollect, this idea that we talk about people broadly with one or two qualities and say that that's enough um, may sound nice, uh, particularly flattering, because he's talking about what would become Americans, but we also need to recognize that we're reading Edmund Burke at, uh, in, in, in kind of the, the height of the slave trade. Uh, in North America, and we're reading it at a time when English-speaking people are really expanding all over the globe uh, and, and, and establishing camps and setting up cultural fronts and all of these kinds of things. And what does it mean if English becomes the language of um, generally summarizing vast people with one or two characteristics and some rather, you know, remedial reasoning? It means that English is on the verge of becoming um, a fascinating global situation, if not a calamity, which is where we're, where I want to leave you at the end of this course, where English has kind of expanded from this kind of kind of guttural kind of peasant tongue to this point where it is now capable or seemingly capable of looking around the globe 
and being used to dispense these kind of broad generalizations about who's out there. And as we get into British literature too, we're going to continue to see the development of the language, but we're also going to see English start to have to become more accountable for itself in terms of how different populations, different cultures start to react to it, okay, and start to, and start to, uh, to wrestle with it. Those of you who have taken American literature, one, know, have seen this explicitly if you've ever read Emerson. Emerson tells us, a um, great American writer, um, Emerson tells us very early on that in the American situation, we need to dismiss Chaucer, we need to dismiss Shakespeare, and we need to start attending to the language of the peasants, of the poor, of children, of people working in their homes, things like that, um, which would seem to suggest that English needs to go back to something like its roots. And that's just one voice of many. Um, that are talking about how English as a language needs to be fundamentally transformed by the American experience, but you also need to understand that this is happening in many other places on the globe at the same time. So there's this great conversation that's about to erupt about the English language and its value, its limitations, its potential, and all these things. And we're very much on the edge of that. Uh, so I do want to end this clap class as a as something of a with something of a cliffhanger okay um, and I'm not doing that necessarily just in a self-serving way so that you pursue it in, in British literature too there are a number of ways you could pursue it the, the investigation of American literature the consideration of different uh, literatures from different cultures and civilizations but what I want you to get is that you're kind of ending at this moment of great dramatic revelation where your language has gone from Cade Mon's hymn to kind of Burke's declaration. And in the span of that 1100 year period, we have seen all kinds of really fascinating developments in terms of how this tongue has been used to describe the human experience through multiple genres, through multiple literary formats, sometimes with great success, sometimes leaving us kind of stunned and confused. But along the way, what we've seen is the human desire to express itself in the universe and its relationship with other people and the universe itself um, in an increasingly, um, uh, uh, increasingly maybe the wrong word, but with a, with, a, with a ferocity that is notable throughout. And so here we are at the end of this lecture. I hope you've enjoyed this course. I hope you've been able to uh, encounter several new authors that have been kind of meaningful for you, have been noteworthy for you, that will be significant to you as you continue throughout your education. I certainly hope you choose to continue on this journey um, with everyone next semester, but if not, I hope you have some great writers to reflect on as you move closer to graduation. And for your hard work, you should certainly be commended and, um, and celebrated, and you should feel good about it. So take some time to feel good about it. Um, also take some time as I'll always remind you to read Homer, if you haven't done that yet. Uh, not part of the course, but it's just part of being an educated person in the 21st century. Knowing the Iliad, knowing the Odyssey, I can, I, and I'm very happy to talk with you about them if you'd ever like to talk about them. But otherwise, guys, uh, I hope you have enjoyed this lecture series, and I look forward to starting the next lecture series at the beginning of next year.